Hello everyone, this is Bob and Threadbear, and welcome back to Threadbear Reviews. The last video I did on Alien was my own selection, but all the rest of this series will be chosen by my patrons. First up is a novel called A Closed and Common Orbit, written by Becky Chambers in 2016, and recommended by patron Ryan Krauss. About the Author Becky Chambers was born in the Los Angeles area in 1985 and after graduating from high school, she moved north and studied theater at the University of San Francisco. She then traveled abroad, living for a time in Iceland and Scotland, but these days, she and her wife have made a home for themselves back in San Francisco. In the spring of 2012, while Chambers was still in Iceland, she started a successful Kickstarter campaign for $2,500 so that she could finish her first novel, The Long Way to a Small Angry Planet. In 2013, she self-published the book for her backers, and it got her so much attention that in 2015, the British publishing house Hodder & Stoughton picked it up and republished it. The book then earned accolades like reaching the shortlist for the Arthur C. Clarke Award, and a nomination for the Sidney James Bounds Award for Best Newcomer. In 2016, Chambers released A Closed and Common Orbit, which, like her first novel, takes place in the Galactic Commons universe. The book was a finalist for the Hugo Award for Best Novel, as was its sequel, Record of a Spaceborn Few. We're taking a look at the second book in this series, because it operates on a more personal and intimate scale than either of the other two, and that's a requirement I've set forth for the series. It's also an independent story, so you don't have to read Long Way in order to understand Common Orbit. As for the future, Chambers has signed a two-book deal with Tor Books, but neither one has been released yet. The Review A Closed and Common Orbit tells two stories at once. The first story is about Jane 23, a female human clone who was created on a human fringe world in order to sort through scrap. One day, she escapes her factory when a random explosion blows a hole in the wall, and she takes refuge in a scrapped but still mostly functional shuttle with a sapient AI system. The AI, named Owl, raises Jane and teaches her about the universe, and after nine years, she fixes the shuttle and escapes the planet. She also brings along a boy named Lorian, since he had been exiled to the trash side of the planet, and he helped her get fuel. Unfortunately, Owl is confiscated and sold off once Jane and Lorian reach civilization. The second story is about a sapient AI named Lovelace. Jane and Lorian, now called Pepper and Blue respectively, download Lovelace from her ship housing into a body that can pass for human. Doing this is very illegal, but after being raised by an AI, Pepper believes that they deserve the same rights as any other sapient species. Lovelace renames herself Cedra, an Arabic name meaning of the stars, and spends a considerable amount of time adjusting to life in a human body. And along the way, she makes friends with an alien tattoo artist named Tack. Eventually, Pepper finds out that Owl's shuttle is now part of a museum display, and so she, Blue, Cedra, and Tack work together to download Owl out of the shuttle and bring her back to the planet where all of them live. Something I noticed pretty quickly is that A Closed and Common Orbit is a very science light book. Cedra's humanoid housing runs on the kinetic energy it generates by moving, even though that's very impossible. In fact, that impossibility is why humans and other animals need to eat food to survive. Also, the planet that the Cedra section takes place on is tidally locked to its sun, and yet the entire surface, including both the full light and dark sides, is safe for human life. Of course, not every science fiction book needs to go all in on the science part, and ultimately these and other discrepancies have no real bearing on the plot. The aliens in the book are very imaginative and unique. Some have scales, some have feathers, and one species called the Aluan communicate using electromagnetic radiation and color-changing cheek patches instead of sound. The book goes into detail about the Aluan, since that's the tattoo artist's tax species, and I was interested in the aside about how Aluan society works, even though it has nothing to do with either of the main plots. 
On the other hand, I think the book could have used a more complete description for each of the alien species we encounter. The text is quick to remind us of details like feathers and colored skin patches, but I wasn't sure just how humanoid these aliens were supposed to be, or whether they were bigger, smaller, bulkier, thinner, and so on. Chambers may have provided full descriptions in her first book, but generally it's a good idea to repeat basic descriptions like these in sequel books to remind readers what people look like and to help new readers such as myself understand what's going on. Because of this issue, I never got a clear idea of what Tack looks like. The braided storyline, a storyline that alternates between two or more smaller stories, is a fairly solid and well-used device, but it's important for the braided stories to have some sort of solid connection to each other. Otherwise, well, why am I not just reading two novellas, one after the other? In this case, the two stories definitely have this connection. Both are about a person who was denied the full human experience, but suddenly gets that opportunity and has to make a lot of adjustments. It would have been nice if the alternating sections had more direct parallels to each other, but it's fine that they didn't. You need to be a real master to iron out that level of detail. Overall, I think my single largest complaint is that Cedra's character development is very backloaded. Cedra spends most of her story feeling out of place and thinking that her humanoid body doesn't really belong to her, and the first major change she makes to herself, turning off her honesty protocols, happens in the last quarter of the book. We then don't get much time to explore this change, because immediately afterwards the mission to rescue Owl begins. If Cedra had made this adjustment around one-third of the way through the book instead, it would have given us more time to explore the way she adapts to her new life, and it would have also lined up with the moment when Owl starts teaching Jane about the galaxy in the second story. Still, quibbles aside, I enjoyed reading A Closed and Common Orbit, and I recommend reading it. It's a fairly quick read, it puts some real thought into its central concepts, and the characters were fairly realistic in their conversations and choices. The Analysis the main theme of A Closed and Common Orbit is fairly easy to spot. Both protagonists are treated as something less than human because of the circumstances of their creation, something beyond their control. And even though they have the same internal lives and capacity for reason as any other sapient creature, they are subject to perfectly legal discrimination and they have to fight in order to get the same opportunities and respect as the people around them. In Jane's case, she has to fight to escape a society that sees her as nothing more than a disposable tool, and in Cedra's case, she has to hide her true nature to avoid prosecution and death. This connection is also where the book's title comes from. A closed orbit is an orbit that continues indefinitely, and a common orbit is where two or more stellar bodies share the same orbit. And just in case it's not obvious enough yet, let me spell it out. This book was written by a lesbian and is about the experience of being a sexual or gender minority in modern society. It's about having to hide who you really are out of fear. Fear of people who will hate you because of something you can't change, and fear of the laws that support that hatred over your self-expression. It's also about finding allies, people who are in similar situations, or who are open-minded enough to accept you despite being part of the majority. Lorian is an outcast for a very different reason than Jane, but he still supports her, and he helps her get away from her literally toxic home. Tack discovers Cedra's secret by accident, but the two had discussed Cedra's hopes and dreams, and so Tack realizes that Cedra is no different from any flesh-and-blood sapient. Something else the book does is highlight the hypocrisy of drawing arbitrary lines in the sand. When it goes into depth about the Eluan species, it mentions that they have four distinct sexes. Male, female, neither, and a sex that regularly switches between male and female. Galactic society has a gender-neutral third-person singular pronoun, spelled XYR. And yet, despite all of this variety and all of this accommodation for variety, Galactic society still won't accept the idea that sapient artificial intelligences deserve the same rights and respect as organic sapient species. 
And even though Jing's home planet is clearly using child clones as slave labor, the only thing the government does when Jane escapes is confiscate her shuttle because she illegally modified it. As far as galactic society is concerned, that planet is out of sight and out of mind. Still, what closed in common orbit does provide an optimistic ending. The protagonists aren't able to change society around them, and Cedra is never able to proclaim whom she really is, but they are able to create a life for themselves and even build a family of sorts between the people that they chose instead of the people they were born to. Equality may still be lacking, but at least it's possible to enjoy your life, no matter how human or inhuman the law says you happen to be. Thanks for joining me again for today's Threadbare Review, and I hope I'll see you next time. Until then, please remember to like, share, and subscribe, and if you have a little extra money to spare, you can support me on Patreon. Link in the description.